Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down Huck by Mark Miller. Now, Miller does all kinds of books. Some of his books veer towards being very cringy and super violent, along the lines of his books Wanted, Kick-Ass, and Nemesis. But some of Miller's books can be very touching and inspirational and very heartfelt, like Superior and Starlight. Well, Huck really falls more into that camp. And Huck is also one of the books that most people consider one of the good Mark Miller books. Uh, I think all of Miller's books are pretty fun, but some of them are kind of middling. But uh, Huck is definitely one of the better ones. Huck is about a man that works in a small town as a gas station attendant. He has some superpowers, and he uses those powers to do a good deed each day for his fellow citizens. Throughout the course of the book, though, the media discovers his powers and Huck's life blows up and he gets sucked into a more overarching story that goes beyond him. And it leads to some pretty exciting stuff. All right, let's dive into it now. Huck by Mark Miller. Huck, all American, written by Mark Miller, art by Raphael Albuquerque and colors by Dave McCaig. Issue one. We begin by seeing a couple of men driving a pickup truck. They think they hear a noise atop their truck. Above them is a man hitching a ride. The man is physically large and strong with blonde hair. He is jumping between cars and is getting ahead of them on their journey. We then see this man running on the ground at night by a field during the daytime. Then towards the edge of a cliff. Who is this man and where is he headed to? We now see the man jump off of a cliff and then dive deep, deep into the water, swimming further and further below. Deeper and deeper he heads until he discovers a pile of trash in the water. And then the man sifts through the trash and he picks something up that is shining bright in his hands. This man is the main character of this story. He is none other than the small town big man with an even bigger heart and some pretty special abilities. His name is Huck. Later on, we see that a doorbell is being rung and a woman answers her door. The woman is named Diane Davis. To her surprise, no one is there, but then she discovers a gold chain that she had lost in the garbage some time ago. She says out loud, it looks like somebody actually found it. And from across the way, we see the onlooker, Huck, has made sure that the found item that he retrieved is back in the right hands. The next day, Diane, the woman whose gold chain was found, is now at her next door neighbor's house, the house of Miss Taylor. Miss Taylor says to Diane that she wanted to have her over for some coffee and pie so that the two of them can chat a bit. Miss Taylor tells Diane that it is time they talk about Huck. Diane asks, You mean the slow guy from the gas station? Miss Taylor replies, Well, I wouldn't say slow. He's quiet, that's for certain. But there's a lot of wisdom there, too. We prefer the term special. Miss Taylor then tells Diane that she knows that she just moved in next door, but she wanted to let her know that Huck is the one that tracked down her gold chain. And... Him tracking stuff down wasn't anything unusual. Finding things is kind of what he does, and if things go missing, well, it's usually returned back to its rightful owner soon enough. Miss Taylor continues that Huck is a very strong man who doesn't get tired. She even once saw him pull a truck from a river, and he also ran all the way to California once just to deliver a Christmas card. Diane asks Miss Davis, is she trying to play some sort of joke on her? How could a man pull a truck from a river? Miss Taylor says that it's not for anyone to understand how it is that Huck does the things that he does, but why he does these things. It is because when he was a newborn, he was left outside of an orphanage with a note in his basket. The note was asking for help and taking him in. The note in the basket said, please love him. When the orphanage took Huck in, they raised that boy to become a good man and do a good deed for somebody every single day. And that's exactly how he lives his life. Diane responds that 
This is the craziest thing she's ever heard. And Miss Taylor to this says, Young lady, our town has been blessed with Huck, and this secret is such an important one that we need this secret to be kept that way. We then head over back to Huck, where we see that he is starting his good deeds for the week. On Monday, he helps out his co-worker at the gas station named John Clancy. John tells Huck that there's a tree stump behind his house that even a tractor couldn't pull out. Huck agrees to help John make space for his new barn by removing that tree stump. And Huck is glad that John asked. On Tuesday, Huck takes out the garbage for the entire town. On Wednesday, Huck was in the lineup at a drive through but not in a car as everybody else was. No, he was just physically standing in line himself, along with the other cars. The passengers in the car behind him asked, What are you doing? We're trying to use the drive through They commented amongst themselves, What's he playing at? He's not even in a car. But Huck, he bought everybody in the line behind him lunch on that day. On Thursday, in the middle of nowhere, Huck is walking around as a car driven by Diane Davis is approaching him. She wonders what the heck is Huck doing out here? She asks if everything is okay with Huck? Huck replies that he's real sorry ma'am and that he should have watched where he was going. Back at Diane's house the next day, she and Miss Taylor are catching up outside. She asks Miss Taylor if she's sure that Huck isn't crazy? She saw him walking around last night missing his shoes and he was looking soaking wet. He was in the middle of nowhere. To this, Miss Taylor asks if Diane has seen the newspaper this morning. The headline in the newspaper read, Missing Fisherman, Safe and Well. So clearly Huck was the one that saved them. Diane, she wonders, if Huck has all these special abilities, what on earth is he doing working at a gas station? If he really has all these amazing powers, why isn't he using them to make himself rich? Miss Taylor responds, because some things are more important than that. Huck, he just likes to make people happy. While this is going on, back over to Huck's house, he is sitting there with his pet dog, Mickey. Huck, he reads a special note as he often does. The note that was attached to him in his blanket when he was left at the orphanage that day so many years ago. The note that says, please love him. The next day on Friday, we see Huck writing down some possible good deeds he could deliver that day. While he is working on this list, he overhears a news update on his television. The announcer on TV says... Boko Haram attack in North Africa. Over 200 schoolgirls kidnapped. Huck is concerned listening to this on the news. So, what does he do? He takes a flight to search for the kidnapped schoolgirls. Boko Haram is an Islamist militant organization based in northeastern Africa. And they were apparently responsible for this attack in North Africa with the kidnapping of these 200 schoolgirls. So, Huck... He heads over to that part of the world. One of the Boko Haram militants is yelling at one of the kidnapped schoolgirls. But then, suddenly, there is some sort of explosion happening in the background. The men are taken down, and Huck, he comes up behind one of the still-standing militants. Huck tells the shocked-looking man to take off his glasses. He then grabs the man and throws him far into a pile, with all the other militants laying there. Why did Huck have the man remove his glasses first, though? Probably because, despite this militant being a bad guy, Huck likely didn't want to hurt him or break his glasses when he ended up tossing him far into the air. Huck, he then unloads a backpack full of candies that he brought for all the girls that he has now freed. But he asks them a favor, and that favor is to keep it a secret that he was the one who came to free them. Now back on the news, the schoolgirls are being interviewed. They've emerged from the forest where they were being held captive, and they are grateful and smiling, but they are unwilling to reveal who rescued them from the militants. One of the reporters asks if this was the work of an American Special Forces unit? The girls refuse to respond though, saying that they made a promise not to say who. Watching this all on the news on her television set at home, 
Diana Davis turns to her husband and tells him that she knows this must have only been that odd guy, Huck, who was able to track down these girls in the middle of nowhere. Her husband says that that is really some big news. And he questions, how much money does she think that they could possibly get if they went public with this secret information? Diane Davis, she ended up deciding to share Huck's secret with the press. The next morning, Huck wakes up. It is just a normal, typical day for him. He walks over to his window and he looks outside. And outside of his house are several reporters and the press. And they appear to want to speak with him. Huck, looking on, says, Oh my gosh! He is concerned with all of this commotion and for once, he isn't quite sure what to do in this situation. Issue 2 we are now going back in history to 1981 in Siberia, Russia. A man named Professor Orlov is speaking to a young red-haired girl named Anna. In the freezing icy Siberian winter, Anna is standing in what appears to be a hospital or patient's gown. The scientist, Professor Orlov, turns to Anna. He asks her, Tell me, Anna, what is Commander Veselov holding in his hand right now? To this, Anna uses her apparent telepathy powers and responds that, in the submarine down below, Commander Veselov is holding a picture of a nesting doll on a postcard from his mother. It is confirmed that that is indeed correct. Professor Orlov congratulates Anna, and she responds by saying, Thank you. We also see that Anna is wearing what appears to be some sort of tracking device on her ankle. She is a prisoner of this military scientist. Back to the current day now in America, in the state of Vermont this time. A boy is holding a violin, and he is dropped off outside of his music teacher's house. This boy is named Ethan. Inside the house is a woman who is going by the name Miss Jones, but... She is actually the Anna that we saw in the flashback in Siberia, Russia in 1981. Anna is watching the news on her TV screen. She appears in wonder while watching the live reaction of the press outside of Huck's house. They are stating that the 34-year-old gas station attendant, known locally as Huck, is being introduced as America's Good Samaritan. The boy, Ethan, heads inside the house of Anna, as no one was answering the door. When he finds Anna, he asks if it's still okay if they have their violin lesson this morning. Anna, who looks like she's just seen a ghost on TV, responds to Ethan. Ethan, I'm sorry, would you mind coming here for a second? She pulls Ethan close with her hand behind his ear, and she whispers for him to sleep. The boy's violin falls to the floor and he collapses in her arms. And then she continues listening to the news as it plays on in the background. Back one state over in Maine, USA, in Huck's hometown. Miss Taylor is rushing through the crowd of reporters outside of Huck's home, telling them to all get out of her way. She goes and visits the police chief and asks him, if there's anything that can be done about this commotion outside of Huck's house. The police chief tells her that it's freedom of the press, Miss Taylor. Back in Huck's home, Miss Taylor enters and asks how he's doing. While his other motherly figure friends, possibly the woman who took him in at the orphanage as a baby, say that Huck has been understandably upset. Miss Taylor asks, how much about him do they know? One of the women responds that they seem to know everything. The woman talking say that they could just strangle that new neighbor of theirs, Diane Davis, for leaking the secret of Huck to the press. The ladies try to devise an escape plan to move Huck into isolation elsewhere. As all this nonsense is taking place out front, Huck looks outside the window of his house. There, he sees a woman holding a note with tears streaming down her face. With children surrounding this poor woman, Huck naturally feels drawn to her. Huck stands up and tells the woman in the house that he needs to get out of here. The woman asks him if he's crazy to want to leave the house right now. Huck says there's a lady outside who seems really upset and 
He thinks that she came to ask him for help. As he reaches for the doorknob to leave the house, the woman tell him not to go and that he needs to hide. But Huck, he leaves anyway. And while walking through the bombarding group of reporters outside, he just politely excuses himself and asks them to let him pass by. Huck goes up to the woman he saw and asks her, Is there something I can do for you, ma'am? The woman, grateful to see him, tells him that she's been trying to find her husband since he disappeared five years ago. The police have given up and she just needs to know if he's dead or alive. She tells him that she's got three kids and the youngest can't even remember their dad. She wants to know if Huck can help her in order to gain some closure. Huck responds to her that, of course, he will do everything he can to assist her. As he's about to leave and help out this woman find her missing husband, an older couple holding a picture of their daughter stops him. They say, excuse us, could you also please help us find our daughter? She disappeared after an argument 18 months ago and we think she might have gotten into drugs. Then another woman stops Huck. She's holding a picture of her brother. She tells him that her brother was a contractor working in Afghanistan and that he was kidnapped six months ago, but her family couldn't afford to pay the ransom to get him back. And then another girl comes around. She holds up a picture of her missing dog. She says, could you please help me find my dog, sir? Huck responds, not a problem. Uh, just let me get a pen so I can write all of this down. Huck, he then writes down his new list of good deeds to perform in order to help all of these people out. So he needs to find the woman's missing husband, someone's missing daughter, a missing brother, and a missing dog. As he prepares himself for his first mission, he lets them all know that his neighbors are in his house right now with a hot cup of coffee if they need it. What a wholesome guy this Huck is. Well, Huck is preparing to leave and facing more reporters' questions in the background in front of a flower shop. Huck's friend, named Zoe Fox, is standing there with her son and her co-worker. The co-worker says that this is exactly what the town didn't want happening. Zoe tells her that she hopes Diane Davis realizes what she has done. As Huck is making his way to start the first good deed on his list, in trying to find this woman's husband, we see that Diane Davis is looking on from inside the window of her house. She appears sad. Some tears are now streaming down her face. It seems like she is actually feeling remorseful after leaking Huck's secret about his powers to the world. As Huck is now dodging people, buildings, cars, and different modes of transportation, he is slowly making his way to this missing husband. A news helicopter is following Huck live and reporting on his progress. We then see a man who is watching Huck's travels on the news and how Huck is closing in on him. This man is actually the missing husband, the one that Huck is looking for. It turns out he's not really missing, but more so hiding from his previous wife and shacking up with this new woman. This man's name is Mr. Lindemann. Mr. Lindemann turns to the woman he's with now and tells her, ah, we gotta grab the babies and pack their stuff up and get the heck out of here. He reveals to her that he might not have been entirely honest with her when they first met. And then his doorbell rings. Mr. Lindemann answers the door to see Huck is standing there with a large group of worried citizens who are concerned for the man's safety. Huck asks, are you okay, Mr. Lindemann? Clearly embarrassed, Mr. Lindemann looks at the woman behind him and he is clearly in real trouble now, as this new girl looks pissed. Elsewhere in Afghanistan, we see a man being held hostage by armed hoodlums in a moving truck. This man is one of the other people that Hawk is looking for. The armed hoodlums tell this man, who is understandably paranoid and sweating, not to be angry with them. It's not their fault his family hasn't paid up the ransom for him. One man with a big machete looks at the terrified man and says, Don't worry, I promise I'll make it quick. You won't even know that I've swung. While this is happening, out of nowhere, Huck stops in front of the moving truck 
he picks up the truck with all of his might and tosses it away. Then he rescues the man who had been kidnapped, who was the brother of the woman who had asked Huck for help earlier. Before they leave for safety, Huck puts the man down and assures him that he won't let him get hurt. Now in another part of the world, we are at a new place called Science City 33 in Siberia in the present day. The scientist named Professor Orlov, whom we met earlier in 1981, is looking a little older and more serious now. On the news, he is watching the whereabouts of this new phenomena named Huck. Back in America, in the state of North Carolina this time, we see a couple of men playing pool at a bar. One of the men is named Tom. Tom looks like a trucker. He has a hat, red hair, and a beard. He's also watching the news and learning of this man named Huck. The man that Tom's playing pool with asks him, what's he so happy about? Tom responds that he's happy because he's just seen someone he's been searching for his entire life. His brother. Issue 3 Heading over now to a different state, New Jersey, Huck is in the slummy part of the city called Camden. A kid there goes up to him and tells him to beat it. This is private property. Huck tells the boy that he's here to meet Lindsay. Now, if we recall, Lindsay is the daughter of the couple who were pleading with Huck to help them find her. The one who had disappeared 18 months prior and may now be into drugs. Despite the boy telling Huck to leave, Huck stays determined to find her. He insists that he will continue on his way. Huck, passing through the alleyways, then enters into a derelict, abandoned building. In it are many sick people who appear to be out of it and on drugs. And then he spots a woman on the ground. Huck says to her, Lindsay, can you hear me? I'm a friend of your mom and dad's. I've come to take you home, miss. And out of nowhere, a man with a mohawk hairstyle comes and starts pointing his finger at Huck. What the hell, man? You ain't taking her? Huck responds to him that, This young girl needs medical attention right now, sir. And then the mohawk guy yells back, Yo, bro, that's my girlfriend, you asshole. And she's not leaving this place. Huck, upset by this, replies, you obviously don't have much respect for her as a human being. The boyfriend says to his friends, Yo, is this guy for real? You want to talk about respect? And then the guy pulls out a gun. But this does not phase Huck. He then pulls out some of his superhero moves and launches this dude right out the window to the ground below. And then he carries Lindsay to safety. Next stop, Huck heads over to Rockport, Maine. In Rockport, Huck is moving some rocks around, some really big rocks. He moves apart this big boulder that is blocking an entrance to a cave. The young girl with him, who had asked Huck for help earlier, is holding some dog treats in her hand, beckoning what awaits inside there. And then, inside is the woman's dog, who is of course hungry for treats. Huck has found the missing dog. Huck considers this another win and crosses off this final missing loved one on his list. A month later, back in Huck's hometown, we see Miss Taylor along with Zoe and her son. She is cutting out some newspaper clippings with various stories of all of Huck's good deeds. Huck has been surging in popularity lately. He even met the mayor of their town and... Huck has been invited to the governor's big party that evening. Miss Taylor is concerned a bit, though. She says that she's worried that they're going to take advantage of Huck's good nature. Zoe wonders if it's not such a bad thing that Huck is going to this party. I mean, maybe Huck is finally going to get recognized for all of his good deeds. We now jump over to the hotel where the governor's party is going to be taking place. Huck has even been given a hotel room for the night. And right now, Huck is getting dressed for the party. The governor's assistant is trying to help Huck put on a tuxedo. Huck is wondering 
If he really needs to be wearing a tux? The governor's assistant responds, It's a black tie event and that of course, every man will be wearing a tux, Huck. Huck tells her that he would really just be more comfortable wearing his overalls, that he, he just ironed them. Outside the window in the alleyway, Huck hears some scrambling noises and sees some skinny, hungry, malnourished cats rummaging through some garbage cans. Huck is concerned. He wants to help those cats. But the assistant tells him that the cats are fine and he needs to just put on his tux and they need to head downstairs to the party now. Reluctantly, Huck agrees. And as he's putting on his suit, we get a sneak peek of what is happening in the governor's ballroom. The governor is named Larry Mitchell and he is hosting this benefit to honor Huck's good deeds to society. Some of the governor's colleagues, though, are a little bit disrespectful towards Huck. They ask the governor, So, uh, is this Huck as much of a retard as they're saying? The governor responds, he's not a retard, he's just a little slow. One of the governor's friends says, Well, that slowpoke is gonna get you re-elected, Larry. Can you believe you've got a superhero as one of your constituents? The governor smiling says, <laughs> Wait till you see what we're doing with them next, boys. The president and I have some very big ideas. And then, eventually, Huck comes down the stairs to the party. Various people start talking with him. A lady named Miss Ho goes up to Huck and thanks him for helping her assemble her kitchen last summer. Huck tells her, It was no problem, ma'am. Another man says he works for VH1 and he's wondering if Huck is interested in being part of a reality TV show? And then Governor Larry interrupts and tells Huck that he's going to have a meeting with the Secretary of State on behalf of the President and they want to uh, set up some sort of formal arrangements with Huck. Huck, a bit shy, tells the Governor uh, he doesn't know much about politics. And then a hooker offers her hotel room key as an invitation to Huck and she tells him that She's staying in this same hotel as him. Huck, a little bit overwhelmed, just says, Uh, thank you, miss. The governor's assistant then approaches Huck and says that the governor wants to take a picture with him and his campaign team. She asks Huck, Do you think you can lift all of these people up? Huck says, Yes, he can. And she tells him, Not to forget to smile for the camera. So Huck, he lifts up all of these people on opposite sides of a giant barbell wait as a photo gets snapped. Later that night, Huck is sad, unamused, and not fitting in. He's now back in his hotel room. He is looking again at the note that was left in his baby basket at the steps of the orphanage that morning so long ago. The note that said, please love him. After a few moments of taking it all in and feeling human, he looks outside the window and sees that the hungry cats are still there in the alleyway. Huck, he then calls room service and orders all of the fish and chicken dinners that they have, without forgetting to say the word please, of course. Huck then brings all of the plates delivered by room service out into the alleyway to feed the hungry cats. While he is feeding the cats, he overhears someone in the background saying, Oh man, can I be a cat in my next life? There, we see two poor men sitting down in the alleyway. They are homeless veterans, and they too are hungry. The same man asks Huck, Nobody's asking to take food from those cats' mouths, but a little bite of a uh, chicken leg wouldn't go amiss. Huck, perplexed, asks them, You guys haven't had dinner yet? The men have not. Huck, disappointed to hear that these men are sleeping outside and eating scraps, he offers them his hotel room key. He tells them that there are drinks in the minibar and that they can order whatever they would like from room service. The men are skeptical. They ask if he's for real and where is he going to be? Huck tells them, me? Oh, I'm going home, sir. I've already got a bed at home and I don't need two of them. He wishes them a nice night and says to tell the governor he's sorry that he'll have to miss breakfast with him in the morning. Huck, he then continues traveling home. He leaps atop buses and sprints across the land. He prances across the air and he eventually lands on a moving train. 
When he is atop that train, he is admiring a free pen that he was gifted at the hotel. While he is aboard that train, he hears a voice behind him. The voice says, Hello, Huck. Oh, man. You have no idea how amazing this is after all these years. Huck is a little confused. This man is named Tom. We met him earlier when he was watching Huck on a TV screen at a bar he was playing pool at. Huck doesn't know this man. Huck asks the man who he is. The man replies, I'm your brother, man. I'm your brother. You want to go meet mom? Huck has a surprised look on his face. Issue 4 Back in Siberia in 1981, we see that young woman Anna. She is escaping, running through the snow. Earlier, we saw this same woman guessing the photograph being held by the commander in a submarine. Now, these men are after this escaping woman. They are shooting at her and trying to capture her again. She runs towards the edge of a cliff. A group of men are waiting for her there. They stop her from reaching the water below. Suddenly, Anna destroys the ground of this snowy cliff. The men get scattered everywhere. Anna, she then deep dives into the sea below. The soldiers are on the lookout for Anna. They have helicopters and scuba divers. They start trying to track her down in the water. From the tracking device on Anna's ankle, they get a reading that she's about 50 feet under. They assume she's wounded, but then they discover that Anna has removed the tracking device and she is elsewhere. So they have officially lost track of her. Back in the present day in the United States in Maine, Huck has brought his new brother, Tom, back to his hometown to meet his friends. They are meeting Zoe and Miss Taylor. Tom, he explains to everybody the story about their mother. We get a flashback to 1981 again. Anna, she was 16 years old when the Soviets found her in her village. She was strong and fast like Tom and Huck, but she had psychic powers too. One of her powers would allow her to make people do what she wanted them to do, just by touching them with her fingertips. At the time, the Russians and Americans were in a race to build a powerful super soldier, but no one was getting ahead the way that they wanted with the mission. But then the Russians discovered Anna in her small village. It was a big deal for the Russians. They abducted her and locked her away to see what gifts she had and what really made her tick. They tried to make copies of her, but failed. They realized that a baby would have the same effect, if not better, for their mission. Anna, she was impregnated, and then later on she started feeling the life of her twin boys inside of her. She suddenly felt that it wasn't just her being held captive alone anymore, it was now her little boys too, and she wanted out. The head scientist, Professor Orlov, he actually had kind of a crush on Anna, and with this attraction, Anna played into it, and she pretended she was flattered by his advances. Late one night when everyone was gone, she convinced Professor Orlov to open her cell. Orlov, he told Anna that she has no idea how much he fantasized about the two of them being together. Anna told him that this is only the beginning. She then grabbed Orlov close to her and whispered in his ear, open every door in the complex. Due to Anna's powers, Orlov would have to oblige. As the doors are opening, she then whispers in his ear, You make me want to vomit. Anna, she grabbed Professor Orlov's head and then slammed it into the wall. Some men returned and told her not to move and get back into her cell right now. But then Anna escaped by these men. She blasted through the wall and jumped into the sea below. As Tom is explaining this story, Zoe asks him, How did she get to America? He tells her that she swam at six months pregnant. Their mom was really tough. She wanted to protect them no matter what. Tom continues explaining that once their mother made it to America, she split the boys up in case the Russians ever came looking for them. Tom was left with church people in North Carolina, and Huck was left here at the steps of an orphanage. 
Huck, taking in all of this new information, thinks about how very scared their mother must have been. Zoe, she wonders if their mother is still out there. Tom says that his adoptive parents have never heard from his mother again, but with them all together right now, he's hoping that Huck can maybe use his powers to track people down and they can find her. Huck, he is of course interested in this. He wants to track their mother down. He says he can't do that without some information about her though. He says he would need a photo or a name. Tom, he then tells Huck, their mother's name is Anna Paulina Mariana Kozar. Later on, the twin brothers, Huck and Tom, prepare to find their mother. Huck's friend at the gas station, John Clancy, offers them his truck to get where they're going. On his way out, Huck tells the ladies that no matter what, even if he really does find his birth mother, nothing changes. These women will always be friends and family to him. Zoe, she offers to watch Huck's dog, Mickey, while he's going away. Huck is grateful and thanks Zoe. Later on, when Huck and Tom are in the truck driving, Tom tells his brother that he noticed that that Zoe woman is in love with him. Huck to this as Zoe? No way. Tom tells him that he can't believe he only shook her hand. Could have at least gave her a hug or something. Huck is in disbelief. He tells Tom that Zoe's the most beautiful girl in town and she wouldn't be interested in a guy like him. Zoe could have any cool guy she wanted. Tom assures his brother that, hey, he is a cool guy. Huck is flattered, but he feels like he's being teased. He can only imagine how special it would be to have Zoe in his life as more than just a friend. As the men continue driving, they see speeding fire trucks are headed in the opposite direction. Huck suddenly swerves the truck around and goes in the same direction that the fire trucks are headed. They are then at the scene of a burning building. Huck arrives and rescues the people from inside. Then, in another scene, we see that Huck is rescuing a bunch of circus animals who escaped from a truck that had been overturned. Then, Huck stopped to let a family of little ducklings safely cross the road with their mother. So, Huck and Tom's journey to see their mother keeps getting a little bit delayed one heroic and altruistic act at a time. We then jump over to Vermont to Anna, Huck, and Tom's mother, who is also the music instructor living a secret life. Anna is there stroking her cat named Skeeter. While watching the news about Huck on TV, she says to Skeeter that maybe she should give Huck a call. It's not like she hasn't thought of it before, but she doesn't want anybody knowing the connection between them, and she dreads what might happen. Huck and Tom continue driving to meet their mom. Huck says that he hopes when they find their mother she's not disappointed in him. He's only a gas station attendant after all. Maybe she was expecting him to be something better. Tom reassures his brother that their mother is going to love him and that is going to be the best day of her life. Huck says that as mad as everyone was at his birth mother for abandoning him, he can't be angry towards her at all. If it wasn't for her, Huck wouldn't be here and he wouldn't have a mother and a brother. The two brothers get out of their truck and they arrive at their mother's house to surprise her. Anna, she then hears her doorbell ringing. She answers her door and Huck excitedly yells out to her in a boyish voice, Hello mom, it's your boys! Anna. Staring at the two men, says the Huck, I only had one son. Oh shit! <laughs> Tom, enraged, then grabs Huck and puts him into a chokehold. Anna, terrified, then gets pushed violently by Tom. Tom then turns around and says, It's safe to come out now, Professor Orlov. They're both down. We then see Professor Orlov entering from the shadows behind them. He is looking a little bit differently now than he was in 1981. He is looking like an older, more buffer, and angrier version of his former self. Orlov turns to Anna, his former love interest, the young pregnant woman who escaped him back in 1981. Professor Orlov turns to Anna and says, It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance again, Anna. Did you really think we wouldn't find you eventually? We've been looking 
forward to this moment for a long time. It's time to come home now, Anna. It's time to come home. Issue 5 Transported back to Russia now in the present day to a secret containment facility called Science City 33. Professor Orlov is talking to Hawk and Anna, who are trapped in a cell behind some really strong glass that apparently in the past held Anna for five years. Orlov is telling Anna that she couldn't possibly know how much trouble she had gotten him into. He goes on to say that if he wasn't so brilliant, they would have killed him by now. In this secret science facility, Professor Orlov tells them that there are 200 of these facilities across the former Soviet Union. Most of them are known, but some are not. This one is secret, removed from any maps. It is his special creation. He tells Anna that he used to specialize in super genetics, as she knows, of course, because she was the one that they study. That is until they lost their golden goose, referring to Anna going missing. So they diversified into artificial intelligence. Orlov points to Tom and a woman beside him, and he says, These are my AI prototypes. I believe you've already met 15. So Tom's name is actually... 15, and the woman beside him is named 16. So 15 and 16 here are some sort of robots that are run on AI. Orlov tells them though, these AI models, they don't actually work well long term. They stop functioning around 15 months. They sadly cost us a fortune too, so the Kremlin was planning to shut us down in a couple of months. But not anymore, of course. Now that we have you and your son here back in your rightful home. Anna asks Orlov, what are you going to do with us? Orlov explains to Anna. With you? Well, I won't do anything with you. You're beyond childbearing age. We'll probably just dissect you. But with your son, Huck, and the strength and power he has to offer, he is exactly what we've been looking for. The boy can fertilize an infinite number of military volunteers, stronger than the multitude of AIs we've been experimenting with till this point, and a lot cheaper too. Orlov mocking Anna reminds her of all the time in this cell she spent many years ago and how she must be sad to be back here after all her effort of making it out, all that effort for nothing. Huck. He gets extremely angry hearing Orlov disrespect his mom. He starts banging on the glass furiously. Orlov tells Huck there's no point in fighting the glass. It's stronger than anything. It's what held his mother for so long. Professor Orlov pesters Anna saying that the glass also barricades her from touching anyone on the other side. So she won't be able to manipulate anyone to do what she wants. Huck continues to grow angry. Orlov, talking to 15 beside him, says, He isn't very bright, is he? What did you say he did for a living? 15, formerly Tom, replies to Professor Orlov. He pumped gas, sir. He only pumped gas. Orlov to this says, Amazing. He then turns to Anna and says, <laughs> You must be very proud. He says this in a condescending way, though. Anna, she can't take this anymore. She starts begging Professor Orlov to at least release her son, Huck. Orlov tells her not a chance, and he starts walking away. We now see that Professor Orlov has entered another room. There, he meets a government bureaucrat who is holding a briefcase. Orlov tells the man with a briefcase, Well, 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 if it isn't the man who said we were wasting our time, after all the experimenting we did, None of it was ever a waste, for our technology has been brought back to us, the very main resource that we desired. The man with the briefcase replies to this, saying, Hey, I hope there's no hard feelings. He was just doing his job. It wasn't anything personal. He has to understand. Their resources were very limited, and maintaining even one of Orlov's AI robots cost them 30% of their annual budget. 
Orlov replies, Hey, there's no hard feelings at all. Not that he would ever have expected the government to predict any kind of intellectual foresight. Orlov then excuses himself from the man and tells him that he now has to attend a video meeting with some of the higher-ups. Orlov then has a meeting, a conference call, and some of the people on the call are from the Kremlin. One of the men congratulates Orlov, telling him that President Putin would like to pass on how much he is looking forward to seeing Orlov at dinner tonight. Orlov tells the man that after working with a sword over his head for so many years, he must say that this moment is satisfying. Orlov confirms with the man on the screen that is the bonus he requested still available? To this, the man on the screen responds, absolutely. We then see the AI-16. She grabs the man with the briefcase that Orlov was exchanging words with earlier. Orlov asks the soldier for his gun. And then the man with the briefcase begs Orlov not to do it. Orlov tells him that as a man of his reputation, he was completely humiliated and shouldn't have had to beg for so many financial extensions over the years, given his status. The briefcase man, he's sweating. He pleads with Orlov, but Orlov is ruthless. And with his final words, he says to the man that he should have just been patient with him. Orlov then shoots the government bureaucrat that almost ruined his project. So I guess Orlov's bonus was getting to kill this guy. Orlov tells Sixteen to clean it up. He has to go and get ready for his dinner with the president tonight. Back at the glass encasement, Fifteen is watching Hawk and Anna through the glass. Hawk, he appears to be feeling around different areas of the glass, trying to find a weakness. Fifteen tells Hawk he's never going to get through it, no matter what. This glass is super reinforced. Hawk, he tries to reason with Fifteen. He says that Professor Orlov even said Fifteen isn't going to live much longer. They've already given up on him, but Hawk says that he hasn't. He still cares for him. And if Fifteen were to help him escape, then Hawk bets the scientists back home could extend Tom's life as an AI. Fifteen laughs at Hawk. That's his big escape plan? Fifteen says he was only built to track down Hawk and Anna. He doesn't have any fear of dying. He's not human. He's not capable of having petty emotions like humans are. Anna, sitting in the corner, is feeling really defeated by all this. She tells Hawk that she is very sorry for letting him down and feels like she has made a real mess of things. Hawk tells his mom that if it wasn't for her protection of him, he would have ended up living in confinement here his whole life. He hugs his mom and tells her how amazing she is and that he owes her everything. She confesses how proud of him she was while watching him on TV, on the news from afar. As Hawk and Anna talk some more, Fifteen continues taunting them both, and Hawk grows angrier. Hawk, he then reaches out his hand for his mother and tells her that he has finally found a way out of this room. Fifteen, surprised, says, What? Bullshit. You aren't strong enough. Sure, maybe Hawk can't break down the glass, but he can break down the wall. And that is where his mom will come in to help him. Hawk says to Anna, You can make people do anything, right? Anna says yes. Hawk says, Well then, tell me to break down this wall. Meanwhile, in another room, Sixteen comes in to tell Professor Orlov that the plane is just being fueled and will be ready to take him off shortly to attend his dinner with the president. Suddenly, though, there is a big boom. Orlov asks, what the hell was that? The soldiers look ahead. They are confused with what just happened. In a faraway cabin somewhere, the sound and vibration from the boom prompted a red alert signal 500 miles away. We see that that big boom was only the result of Huck punching the wall only once. Huck then says to his mom, Tell me again, mom. Tell me to break down the wall one more time. Anna does so, and Huck gets ready to charge the wall once more. Huck, he runs full force and breaks the wall down, and he runs right past 15, knocking him out of the way. Issue 6, the final issue. 
16 gets word from 15 that Hawk and Anna have escaped. She notifies Professor Orlov. She tells the soldiers to immediately get Professor Orlov out of this place. There is no time for the plane now. Just get him on a truck and get him out of the city right away. 16 then jumps and soars in the air, demonstrating some incredible acrobatic moves. She uses some hyperthermal vision to detect where Anna and Huck have gone on to after breaking through the wall. 15, he is still there with Huck and Anna, and he is ready to fight them. Huck is in a defensive stance. Professor Orlov, he is now riding in a truck for his escape. While getting smuggled out by his staff, they tell him that getting lost in the crowd right now is best, as no one will know to look for them here. While this is happening, Orlov is transferring his work to the backup computer system, a failsafe that he had installed several years ago. He is connected through his computerized watch on his wrist. Back over to Huck, Anna, 15, and 16. They are now all fighting. 15 tells Huck that all of his punches must be exhausting him and that he should stop. But he, on the other hand, never gets tired for he is just a machine. 15, with his super artificially intelligent, heat grated firing arm, zaps at Huck. And while that is happening, 16 grabs Anna and is choking her. Huck, seeing his mom in a losing battle with 16, he then gets motivated to end this fight now. Huck grabs 15, crippling his hands, and then he tells 15 to make 16 stop hurting his mom. Soldiers arrive outside the room that they are in, and they are confirming their targets. They explode open the wall, and then they confront Huck and his mother, and there, on the floor, are 15 and 16, out of power and completely fried out of their AI life. Huck and Anna have won the battle against 15 and 16. As the soldiers move in and approach Huck, Huck looks at them and calmly tells them, I already lost her once, and I'm not going to do it again. The leader of the soldiers there tells his men, fall back, and they all drop their weapons. They do not think they would be able to take Huck. Huck and Anna then make it outside. Anna asks, how will they be able to find Orlov now? Huck, he replies, just leave it to me, Mom. Huck then goes and rips off a lamppost from its base, and then he launches it far and wide into the air like a javelin Olympist. And we see very far away that that lamppost lands and hits the ground in front of the moving vehicle that Orlov was in, and the truck overturns, causing it to crash. Orlov is laying there in that crashed vehicle, Eventually, he is joined by Huck and Anna. Huck tells Orlov, Professor, my mother wants a word. Huck picks up Orlov and carries him over his shoulder. Orlov is begging Anna to please let him go. Anna tells him that he is not going anywhere, not until he gives up his secrets. Anna continues telling Orlov how he has done terrible things to her over the years and she doesn't want others carrying on his work and legacy. She says for him to tell them how to wipe out his computers, and he isn't allowed to lie. Anna, with her powers, compels Orlov to tell the truth. And reluctantly, Orlov tells Anna that it is all voice activated. Anna demands that he tell them more. Orlov says that they installed a code safety word to say, just in case they were ever invaded. And when he says it, everything would be immediately destroyed. Anna asks if there are any extra backup files saved off base. He replies to this defeated, Yes, there are. Anna asks if there is a single code word that would take out everything, everywhere, all at once. He says that there is. She tells him to do it. Professor Orlov, he then speaks into his computerized wristwatch to say the code that will wipe out everything. He says, Anna Paulina Mariana Kozar. The code word was Anna's full name. By saying this, he triggered the destruction of all the files and everything gets wiped out. Anna then says to Orlov, You are so pathetic. I can't even hate you. Orlov, 
looking at Anna, tells her, But you will. You know that I'm only going to do this all over again. Sure, you might have wiped out my machines, but everything I need is still here in my head. The only way to stop me is to kill me. And we both know that you and that dumb son of yours would never have the balls to. As Orlov is walking away, he continues, Of course I was going to win. I am the most brilliant scientist of my generation. And what are you? A peasant, village girl, and a gas pump attendant. Orlov gloats that he will get them back in a cage before long. Anna, she slowly walks up to Orlov. She then places her hand on his face, touching him. And then she whispers in his ear, Forget everything you know about science. Suddenly, Orlov's memory of his profession in science is completely eviscerated from his brain. Anna concludes, Let's see how much trouble you are after that. Now that that is settled, Hawk and Anna are worry-free and they start walking together. Hawk asks his mom, So what now? She tells him, The government denies all knowledge and everything returns back to normal. As the two continue walking, they are catching up and properly getting to know one another. Hawk, then startled, realizes something and says, Oh no! His mom asks him, What's the matter? Hawk tells her that he just realized how far behind he's fallen on his daily good deeds. We then see Hawk getting back on track with fulfilling his daily good deeds. He baked a pie for old Mr. Beatty. He helped some people who were stuck in a flood. He gave $20 to a political party. Hawk's mom asked him, what's this for? And Hawk said he's just donating it to the governor's re-election campaign as he felt really bad that the governor got wiped out in those midterm elections. Hawk then told Zoe how special she is. And then he bought her a bouquet of flowers, although he bought it for her from her own flower shop. And then Hawk found his mom's missing kitten. Now in Vermont, in Anna's house, Anna is preparing to move to live with her son, Huck. Ethan, her music student, came by for a final visit to say goodbye. Anna tells him that she will miss him, and that as long as he plays his absolute best, everything will go just fine. Ethan is concerned, he says, that he might freeze up or get stage fright in the middle of his audition. Anna uses her powers and says to the boy, you're going to play better than you've ever played before, Ethan. And her finger touches him under his chin and she says, I insist. So she just used her powers to make him play well. And back home in Maine, Anna has now comfortably moved into Hawk's house. All of the important elder women in Hawk's life are sitting around his table. Hawk is writing out a note in big letters. One of the women asks him, But aren't you worried people are going to pester you now? Anna says to this, Actually, we were kind of hoping for that. Otherwise, what's the point in it all? Huck, he then posts a sign in his window in big welcoming letters that says, Happy to help. Miss Taylor at the table tells them that they'd all be glad to hear that the girl who started all of this nonsense, Diana Davis, well... She put her house up for sale. She's going to be leaving soon. She probably realized that no one in town would ever speak to her again for selling Huck's story out to the press like that. Huck, after hearing all this, goes over to Zoe's flower shop again and asks if he could buy another bunch of flowers. And Huck then takes these flowers over to Diane Davis's house. He rings the doorbell. Diane opens it. And Huck says to her, No hard feelings, Miss Davis. And here we see a new good deed that Huck has fulfilled for someone today. He has forgiven someone who had something on their conscience. We now head over to Moscow in Russia. Four months later, in the middle of freezing winter, on this icy, windy day, the lineup at a gas station is growing ever longer. A man in his car reaches the pump and says to a gas station pump attendant, Cold day today, eh, comrade Orlov? Well... Fill her up. We're going on a long ride. Professor Orlov, who now has no memory of science, is now just a simple gas station attendant, much like Hawk. Orlov responds to the customer. 
Yes, sir. And with that, we end Volume 1 of Huck. All right, so that was Huck by Mark Miller. And I thought this was a good book. The artwork was good. The overall story was really compelling. I think Huck is a great main character. You want to root for him. He has these powers. He's way over the top nice and good. And seeing him contrasted with people that are a little bit less altruistic and kind of bad people, especially when we have the governor and some of the uh, governor's people and seeing them interact with Huck, there's some uh, good comedy there. I thought there were some really good swerves in the story. We have Huck and the mystery of his mom. We have Huck's fake brother, Tom, or 15. That was a great twist there. We had Orlov, who I thought was a really compelling villain. And the story also just wrapped up very nicely. This book just had a great flow, a great beginning, middle, and end with a satisfying conclusion. So yeah, solid stuff. I'm going to give this book an 8 out of 10. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back in the future with another book.